Blunt chest trauma. Let's talk about blunt chest trauma. Now, in ch blunt chest trauma, obviously this is an area where you can have hypotension. They've had blunt trauma, but remember that although they've had chest trauma, they've probably had other trauma, and it's not the most common place to get the hypotension from. Think first about things like the pelvis. Think thir first about things like the belly. Those are more common to give you hypotension yeah. and trauma than it is in the chest. So don't forget about those things. Now, when you do have hypotension and it's, it's a penetrating trauma, it's not just the heart that we're worried about. You can definitely have a laceration or a penetrating injury to your lung and that's probably more common to bleed you down to hypotension than your heart or even the great vessels right so those are the more common things in terms of like you know prevalence now if you're going to do a needle thoracostomy because you're worried about a pneumo it used to be that we we used to do it in the midclavicular yeah. line and now the guidelines have changed to have you do this in the mid axillary line fifth four to fifth four to fourth to fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line and i think we've known for a while that's a better approach but they finally formally changed it kind of a bummer though because it's harder yeah. to get to it is harder to get <laughs> it to it's so like under the, the arm front. and you know, I know yeah. it didn't work very well yeah. but it was much easier <laughs> in peds it still turns out that it's the midclavicular line okay <laughs> um algorithms are always important this one kind of illustrates when you're worried about a blunt cardiac injury sort of what that pathway looks like it kind of walks you through that if they're unstable an echocardiogram would be a really important thing whether it be tte which is what we typically do mm -hmm. versus a tee to really find out what are the blunt cardiac injuries that have occurred that are really of significance yeah. that's your right. diagnostic uh, study of choice now oh yeah this one is this like one. a, this is an injury score. I don't think it's important that you know the injury score, right? That's not no. what we're, the point of this is. The, what's important about this is to recognize the risk factors for bad trauma, yeah, the that things that matter, the left side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that the more, the older you are, the, you know, the crunchier you are and you have poor <laughs> lungs and your physiology isn't as good. So obviously that matters in terms of chest trauma, how many ribs you fractured, whether you have underlying chronic lung disease, if you're on anticoagulants, what your O2 sat, those are things that are predictive of badness and in the setting of chest trauma you want to pay attention to. I love that they start, that you start getting crunchy apparently at 10. That's weird. Yeah, you get yeah. an additional point per 10 year increase over 10. Jeez. You get crunchy apparently early. I don't like, know. Who knew? That's like, I'm, <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's talk about ribs. So rib fractures are super, super common. And we have actually, we've gotten kind of a little bit blase about rib fractures actually, even though they're miserable yeah. to have, absolutely miserable. Yeah. So we don't do rib series anymore. Rib series are out because honestly, they're not great films anyway. You don't really care about the fracture itself. No. You care a lot about what's happening underneath or if there are a whole bunch of them. So we often, and often we don't see them on x-rays. Yes. I find that clinically, if I have somebody with this isolated rib fracture, my exam finds it way better than an x-ray does. Yeah. You do compression, sort of AP compression and side to side compression, and they'll point to exactly where the fracture is. It's like that hurts right there because you move it a little bit. So exam is better than x-rays to find it out. Our job really is, do they have a pneumo? Do they have a pulmonary contusion? Do they have some sort of vascular injury because of that fracture? So that's why we do things like CT scanning, which is a much better way to do this, or full on chest x-ray um, if that's part of it. And we'll talk about ultrasound filters in here a little bit, but honestly, if you're really worried about some of these injuries, you may end up going to CT scan. Now we do worry about certain combinations of rib fractures. So two or more, that again, that's just more force. You're more worried about things inside and the more of them there are, the more you worry. Lower ribs, of course, those are over organs down now in your belly. So your liver, your spleen and your kidneys. Older people don't handle um, having rib fractures very, very well. They just don't breathe very well with it. So that's a problem. And we know that ultimately contusions can, can blossom over time. It can aspirate because they're just had, they, they have problems breathing. Pneumothoraces can happen. And the key just to simple rib fractures is to give pain medicines, pain, pain, pain medicines. And honestly, a lot of people have gone to nerve blocks. That, that you, well, you take away the, the opiate kind of thing you might need to do to really control the pain, and they can breathe well with a nerve block. So that kind of depends on you. I've never had a rib fracture, but I have a cousin that recently had a rib. This is a healthy person, and you know has, she's had three kids, and she had, had a rib fracture. She fell and broke a rib, and she is telling me about how awful this pain is. Mm -hmm. Like, it is so bad. She's well, like, the I other can't thing, believe yeah, how bad they, this is. And they don't breathe. They really don't. They yeah. splint like yep. crazy. And that's yep. sometimes you can listen to them. It's like, wow, it sounds like they have a pneumo. I don't hear yeah. anything moving on that side because it hurts yeah. so much. <laughs> they splint. Expand their lungs. Right. Right, yeah. exactly. Now, first, and I was taught, because I'm a, about 100 million years old, that first and second rib fractures were always something you had to go sort of completely full out work up for. You don't really have to, but you do need to know certain concepts. They're relatively protected and they're small. So it's hard to break a small circle. It's much easier to break a bigger circle. So if you snap one of those, you have a higher force that had to happen that way. So 
all the other things are just a little more likely or maybe a lot more likely. Vascular injury definitely is more associated with first and second rib fractures, but it isn't every time. So that's why this idea of every single time you always got everything imaged, you didn't. It's, you don't have to do that anymore. Although we, I'll tell you, we scan everything now when they have these rep fractures so we catch it. What we do worry about with the force though is myocardial contusion is something, and we're going to spend some time specifically talking about myocardial contusion, but it is something that gets brought up when somebody has enough force to break those two ribs. It can, uh, it can, you can break a bron tear a bronchus for sure, vascular injury we mentioned, and that usually is picked up on scan. If somebody has no evidence of any neuro neurovascular compromise though, their arm is fine, their you know, chest x-ray looks fine, their ultrasound of their chest doesn't show fluid, whatever, they don't have any neurovascular issues, you don't have to go ahead and do imaging of the vessels themselves. You don't have to. We also know though that it's a similar concept when it comes to those two ribs with your scapula and to be honest, your sternum, mm -hmm. the amount of force it takes to break any of those structures is such that you're gonna think about this, whether they've actually had some major injury to something that's neurovascular. Flail chest is where you have rib fractures of, basically it's, I learned it as two or more ribs in, in or three or more ribs in two or more places where you actually, the key is a free floating, floating. section yeah. of rib that's big enough to make a difference. So a single rib broken in two places, it doesn't really matter. But you have now a section of your chest that's big enough that you end up with respiratory embarrassment, with ineffective respiration, where that thing just goes in and out and in and out instead of air going up and down and up and down, sort of in and out of you. And these are amazing to look at. That's why you look for, I'll tell yeah. you that standing at the end of a bed of a trauma patient and watching their chest when they breathe is incredibly informative. Sometimes they'll have a flail sternum. The entire front of the chest will go as they breathe yeah. out, will go in, will we'll <laughs> pop out, and as they breathe out, will go in, and it's like, whoa, that is the weirdest looking thing. The reason is it makes it the ventilation not very effective at all. Our job is to stabilize it. We always joke about, you know, grab the medical student and have them put their hand on the chest and stabilize it from coming out. That's, you know, fine. What you really do to stabilize these things is intubate them. Stabilize from within if it's really a significant flail in, in patients. And you worry about a pulmonary contusion underneath because they end up with a lot of bruising underneath this thing. Think about how much force it would take to break your sternum. I mean, your sternum is it's a pretty... Just, it just gives, you know, me, like, it gives me chest pain oh, yeah. to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and think about why this happens. The most common cause, you're in a car accident and you go into the steering wheel or you have the seatbelt just absolutely compress you. It takes a lot of energy and it's a very high mortality injury because there's important things there behind the sternum, it turns out. I mean, your heart <laughs> is right there. So you want to give your heart a big bruise and make it not work very well? That's not going to go too well. So no. cardiovascular injuries are really common with these. And so you want to do that CT and you to look at that cardiac structures, all those great vessels, you know, there's important things coming out of your heart. So you want to take a look and see if those things are all intact. The other thing besides a pneumothorax that we talk about a lot, but is a big deal is pulmonary contusions. And you may not see this right away. You yeah. may, but it may be something that's a little more delayed as those lungs that are now contused get edematous and start leaking and have capillary damage. And sometimes they can cough up a little bit of pink frothy sputum or, mm -hmm. or a little bit of blood that might worry you because you have this damaged lung now that is going to start kind of leaking and you get out atelectasis. And so if you look at that x-ray, yeah. maybe you start to see some like patchy in infiltrates or some consolidations and it might take a little while, which is why we observe people yeah. who have had bad trauma. Just because you don't see something right up front, there still could be badness that develops. And so pulmonary contusions are one of those things that develop in the SICU or, you know, in their surgical observation right, right. unit. Um, and, you know, as we juice them back up and give them a bunch of fluids because they've been a little bit low on their pressure or we're you know kind of fluiding them up this is where things start to blossom and start to leak more and so being yeah. aggressively fluid resuscitation um, forward with these types of patients can be harmful because you can just mm -hmm. sort of like leak more right and so you know taking over the pulmonary part of it and giving them good oxygenation and ventilation making sure they have good peep if they're intubated um, is important and keeping them on the drier side and not overhydrating them you know, it's one of those principle. things that you don't, we don't see these a lot in the ER, right? Because we get yes. them acutely and this happens over time. But if you ever end up in the situation where there is a patient that's hanging out in the ER long enough and these happen, wow, these are impressive. Yeah. Yes. These really, that boy, I have a tremendous respect for, they can end up really hard to oxygenate yeah, them with say. enough edema. It, it's really, really a big deal. It makes sense why the trauma surgeons get very concerned about this. They see it. We yeah. don't tend to see this. Yeah. I think this is the person who's on the ventilator, whose you know, sats are dropping and you're going check for pneumothorax and there isn't yeah, a pneumothorax. Exactly. Like this is what's happening, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, if you do do an x-ray, you're going to see pulmonary edema. You're going to start seeing this blossoming that's going on, and this is a pulmonary contusion, as you can see. You see it's sort of lobar, um, and it has a distribution, um, and that's a, that's a pulmonary contusion. It's just juicing up. That's what I think of it as. <laughs> now, tracheal bronchial injuries, oh, these are like, these are no good. No oh, good. So right? You mentioned about how yeah. lax larynx larynxes can fracture, laryngi can fracture, and if you tear your trachea, you, it can be game over. This thing can yeah. get, you know, can separate because there are forces that are tethering it mm -hmm. that can then take over if you don't have it intact. So with de deceleration and shear forces, you want to be suspicious about tracheal bronchial injuries. Now, the good thing is that there's air in these structures, and so air coming out of them is usually your clue. There's bubbling in your chest tube that can tell you that there's some kind of bronchopleural fistula. Um, know that most mm -hmm. of the injuries that come along with these usually happen within a couple centimeters of that carina, and you want to look for mediastinal soft air, and if it ruptures, very high mortality, yeah. because obviously it has implications for airway. This can't be fixed easily or quickly, and so there's a lot of hypoxia that can happen, and so, ugh, oh, the, these are so scary. the numbers are not good. Scary, scary. I want to suspect this if my patient is having trouble breathing and there's like air in the situation. I hear that Hammond's crunch. That's more of a test question, but you know, you want to think about that. Um, Sub-Q emphysema, they're starting to have Rice Krispies under the skin. Pneumomediastinum would make me very suspicious for a, a tracheobronchial uh, injury. And so, you know, oxygenating them, ventilating them, being paranoid about it is really, really important, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think. That's really what you can do. Um, we do see pneumomediastinum. This is when you see sub-Q emphysema. If you have the, you know, the classic thing is as you're listening to their heart that you hear this kind of crunch that's happening, this Hammond sign. You say Hammond sign or Hammond sign? I don't sign? know, but poor Hammond, because we, none of us have really ever heard no, this. No, so I know, it's I, true. Poor Hammond, he picked yeah. the wrong thing. He should have picked something else. <laughs> These can, happen, is his finding. these can happen from increased bronchial pressure from somebody smoking on a pipe or, you know, so there's other reasons that this happened beside trauma. But in trauma, you can imagine that there's these moments where this sort of backwards pressure happens and you pop a few things and get a pneumomediastinum. So there's mechanical ventilation. There's Valsalva when you're inhaling drugs. Someone who's being very combative and restraining and pushing pressure backwards. A big, big old sneeze. I love that. <laughs> this is, this is why sneeze. you just let her rip with sneezes. <laughs> yeah. Don't hold it in. Let it, let it out. Rip. Yeah. Yeah. Don't make it go backwards. Just <laughs> let it go out. Yeah. But you can't actually get tension pneumomediastinum. You can accumulate Isn't enough air crazy? to mechanically make a problem. Now, here's an x-ray with pneumomediastinum. You see outside of the normal air pipe that we see, we see a little bit of air on the side. That shouldn't be there. It's such a cool thing. That's you so see so that. interesting. It's, like, oh, it's, it's pretty so cool. cool. Yeah. So this tension mediastinum thing is actually, it's not just a myth. It can no, happen. it's real. Yeah. Um, you get blunt force tr trust trauma or whatever spontaneous stuff, and you accumulate enough air around these important structures that you basically get a cardiac tamponade and you can see the same things. You can see neck vein distension and they just are getting worse and you can look for the, the signs of it. Sub-Q emphysema, this can often be very extensive depending on the amount of trauma that's happened. If I suspect this is occurring and we're progressing towards this, let's get our airway in, intact. Let's put in bilateral chest tubes. Let's let all ways that we can do to let the air out and let that air escape so I can decompress Wouldn't that the whole Wouldn't that be awesome situation. to do a sub-xiphoid needle of some sort and like hear air come out of there. <laughs> that yeah, would just that be would amazing. Be, that'd be cool.